Good morning, church family. Good morning, good morning. Hope you're enjoying this beautiful spring day. As you're making your way in from the uh, atrium, I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's join our voices. Let's get our bodies engaged to give God our full attention. Let's worship together. Take a seat. Our day is going to look a little bit different today. I'll share more about that in a moment. For right now, would you give your attention to the screens for this special video? My favorite 
part of Highland Retreat is just the opportunity that we get to experience church in nature. I love the idea of nature as uh, God's cathedral. The Highland Fellowship Retreat is, going, is something that you don't ever get to experience anywhere else. I went on my first retreat when I was probably about seven or eight. In 2019, they rebuilt Echo Valley, and so we kind of stopped and then COVID hit and we weren't able to go back. And so I'm really excited to see this come back as a, a ministry and for our church to be able to go again. There was a study several years ago that I thought about a lot, and they were thinking about what are the best gifts to give another person? The study after study that they did, they found it was the same thing. It was an experience. When my kids were small, they were uh, swimming and it was, it was really cold, but my father-in-law got in the water and my daughter um, gets up onto uh, this this rock that kids are jumping off of and you know her teeth are chattering and her you know little lips are blue But she's just loving every minute. She's not gonna stop and she walks up to the edge and you just see her You know that this is something she's never done before and the, and the challenge of that and she looks down in the water And she sees her her granddad there and she knows he's gonna catch her and then the kids behind her start cheering her on and before long I see her her little legs leave and she jumps into the water and grandpa catches her and it's just this this really beautiful moment i think one of the coolest things over the years is to watch the different families come through and like even different generations so someone who was close to me was terry simons so terry and her girls went on all of their retreats and one of the last pictures that we took was at the retreat and i think that's I think that's like one of the best memories I have and then seeing her girls continue to go after she passed was kind of really a neat experience. As I think about what I would want someone who's never been to retreat before to know, I wish that I could just download my thoughts and emotions about the retreat into their mind because it's really the feeling that uh, I come back to. I see and I hear the world differently when I'm on retreat. You're not distracted by the outside world. And so I think it's interesting to watch people interact and actually get to build community during that time. Just to connect with nature. I know for me personally, I really enjoy being surrounded by God's beauty and being able to just experience it and also just connecting with other people that you might not know or maybe you don't know them well. Um, there's something about being at a camp and not having distractions that you just get the chance to actually genuinely get to know people. Well, if you have not been to the fellowship retreat before. I'm pretty sure we haven't done it since uh, before the pandemic, and so it's an exciting thing to build that back into our rhythm as a church. Uh, we want to really encourage you to save that date. As you saw, it was like early November, and we're talking about it in spring. And that's because uh, those moments of retreat are really important. Uh, and it's important that we be intentional about what we give our time to. And we believe in this community that building deep relationships with each other is crucial to hear and see Jesus at work in our community. Uh, and so we want to just ask you, hey, if you don't have anything that week, November 1st through 3rd, I think was the date, go ahead and mark that down in your calendar and save that time. Because as we know with Jesus, retreating regularly and getting away from the regular rhythms and the noise is really important if you want to get in on the work that God's doing in our kingdom. And we want you to feel a part of this church family. And you can't do that just by a few moments in between services. You got to do that when you take time to be with people. There's no shortcuts around that. So we want to encourage you to do that. Um, if you are part of our community until then and you want to get more connected, you can fill out a connect card in the seat backs in front of you or come talk to me or one of the, or the staff members and we would love to have a conversation with you. What does it look like to, to get more connected in this community? Um, and a meaningful way for us to be a community together is through um, our offerings 
together through worship and being together, but also through our time and through the talents and through our treasure. Uh, so if you uh, aren't regularly giving to this community in one of those ways, we want to invite you to pray about that. Consider the ways that you can be a part of the work of the kingdom, either financially or in other ways. Um, it's a beautiful thing to be a part of that together. Uh, so today's going to look a little different than normal. Uh, if you were here last week, how many of you were here last week? Um, we probably laughed more than we've ever laughed, I feel like. Last week, it was such a joyful time and experience, and that was intentional uh, because this is this time of Easter tide where we celebrated Easter, but Easter isn't over. The, the, the way they would practice this in Jesus' time was they would celebrate Easter all the way through to Pentecost. And so that was our, our way of doing that last week, is to celebrate and have songs of joy. From my vantage point, I saw a bunch of kids dancing and some adults as well. Jeff was one of those. And it was a time of laughter and smiling and just the lightness of resurrection life. And so today, we want to hear stories about resurrection. So we're going to spend our time today hearing stories. We heard stories from that, that fellowship retreat video of how God has been at work. And we're going to hear stories today through video, uh, even through live sharing of how God's been at work in our community and the ways we're praying for us to be able to see God at work. So in order for us to be able to see that and to pay attention to that, I want us just to center and pray a little bit just so we can slow down and be aware of God's work in our midst. So hold a posture of prayer in whatever way you feel led, and let's pray. Our lives are so small, O oh Lord, and our vision so limited. Our courage so frail and our hours are so fleeting. Therefore, give us grace and guidance for the journey ahead. We are gathered here because we believe that we are called together into a work we cannot yet know the fullness of. And still we trust the voice of the one who has called us. And so we offer to you, O oh God, these things, our dreams, our plans, our vision. Father, shape them as you will. Our moments and our gifts, may they be invested toward bright and eternal ends. Richly bless the work before us, Father. Shepherd us well, lest we grow enamored of our own accomplishment or entrenched even in old habit. But instead, let us listen for your voice, our hearts ever open to the quiet beckonings of your spirit in this endeavor. Let us in true humility and poverty of spirit remain ever ready to move at the impulse of your love and paths of your design. You alone, O oh God, by your gracious and life-giving spirit, have the power to knit our imperfect hearts, our weaknesses and our strengths, our stories and our gifts one to another. We pray that you would unite your people and multiply our meager offerings, Lord, that all might resound to your glory. May our acts of service and creation, frail and wanting as they are, be met and multiplied by the mysterious workings of, workings of your spirit, who weaves all things together toward a redemption more good and glorious than we yet have eyes to see or courage to hope for. May our love and our labors now echo your love in your labors, O Lord. Let all that we do here in these our brief lives and these our brief moments to love and this, the work you have ordained for this community, may they flower in winsome and beautiful foretaste of greater glories yet to come. O Spirit of God, now shape our hearts. O Spirit of God, now guide our hands. O Spirit of God, now build your kingdom among us. Amen. If you're able, will you please stand as we continue our time of worship?
I think the thing that I have struggled with a long time is as part of my identity, I have felt that I am what I do. And it's been a very difficult shift over my life to try to pull that away from that identity to simply being a child of God and a disciple and a person. The thing that I'm learning the most in this season, especially having a 10 month old and knowing that I need to give time to support my wife for us to be able to keep our home together. Being a father and a husband and a disciple, trying to start a career and, and working, all of that takes a lot of time. And when it becomes overwhelming and I feel drained, it's easy to slump into a chair and pull out my phone. So the thing that I have found in my life that needed laying down um, really is my phone. I used to have this anxiety around, oh, I've not checked my emails and my texts over what could what I could be missing out. Um, it doesn't, I just have this piece of being with the people that I love and without having to worry about what else I'm not attending to because God will provide when it gets to that point. And so I really, I think it's just a piece that I have felt that God has resurrected in me, that I do not live with anxiety on what will happen. Good morning, Highland. My name is Julie Seimer. My wonderful husband, Gary, and I um, have four kids, and we have been attending Highland for close to 20 years now. Um, we have a daughter, Grace, who is um, 11 years old, and she has been diagnosed with a genetic condition called Soto Syndrome. Basically, it is an overgrowth syndrome, which causes developmental delays and comes with a myriad of other medical problems. She has battled um, epilepsy, scoliosis, as well as it's an esophageal disease called EOE. And our journey has not been easy. Honestly, it has been hard to see Jesus um, during the journey. It's hard whenever you hear kids make fun of her. It was really hard to see Jesus when I was holding her during a seizure. It has been difficult to watch her tremor in fear, x-ray after x-ray, and worry about her when they had to put her under anesthesia for the 10th, up 10th time. Um, and also, it's hard to see where he is whenever you have an impromptu ER visit and it's just one more thing that you have to add to the list. I think at that time, I was like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. I was talking and um, arguing and trying to figure things out and, and asking, well, you know, where's Jesus? What happened? So I specifically remember a moment when I just looked at her and I said, I am so sorry. You don't deserve this. She loves unconditionally. She is courageous. She is resilient. She has nothing but pure intentions. She actually embodies a lot of what the kingdom is all about. And I'm not going to say that she was created different to teach us. I don't think that would be fair to her, but God is definitely showing Jesus through her. I started seeing Jesus through her childlike eyes. So she has a completely unbiased opinion of others and sees no stereotypes. She has taught me to see people the way that Jesus does. Um, there is a guy that sits on our corner nearly every day. She always asks, what's his sign say? And when he's not there, where's that guy? And whenever we do pass him, she always has to wave and gets excited if he waves back. And one day, she was waving and trying to get his attention and decided to give him a heart. And so she holds up a heart and he gives her a peace sign back. And she just matter of fact says, I love him. That 
that was it. That was the paradigm shift. I don't know if it was an actual aha moment in the journey, but it definitely changed the way I saw things. I told God, I, I see you now. I, I, I see what you're doing. I, I see you, Jesus. He was definitely showing me him through her. And so what Jesus said in Matthew actually echoed through my head. Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like a child, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. And I've never felt closer to the kingdom of heaven than in that moment. That's a powerful, powerful story. Um, and that spirit as we look to our children as models. We're gonna invite everyone to stand, if you're able, and we're gonna invite our children, ages three through kindergarten, to head to His Kids Worship at this time. Uh, the His Kids team will receive you warmly, and then we are gonna continue paying attention to the work of the Spirit in our community. So let's continue to sing together. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. strange and divine I can sing all is mighty yet not I but through Christ in me Ooh, 
sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Julie Danley. I'm going to start with giving a trigger warning before I tell my story. I'll be speaking about abuse and the aftermath of that abuse. Feel free to tune me out or step out if you would like. I'm attempting to tell this story gently, but still a difficult issue to speak about. And if you're in a situation that you need help with or guidance with, please find me or someone else here to talk about it with. To start off, I want you to be aware that many times life is not what it seems from the surface and people are not always what they seem from the surface. And the lives you see them living are not always what they seem from the surface. Life can seem glittery or easy or families may seem happy, again, all from the surface. It has been assumed of me my whole life because I have a cheerful exterior that I've had a very easy, cushy life, and that cheerfulness comes from easy. But that might be as far from the truth as it could be. I grew up in a house that was full of strife, did not often feel safe, and was not the place you ran to for comfort. My mom was beautiful and full of life, and my dad could appear charming and funny, but inside our house, my mom was mostly a safe person, but my dad rarely was. As children, our emotional well-being was pushed aside from my dad's ego and his brute assertion of his role in our house as the dad. Not daddy or warmth or kindness, but control. He was demeaning, physically abusive, and downright scary. I have memories of the abuse, but not the earliest incidents. My mom told me that the first incident of physical abuse happened when I was 18 months old, when I wouldn't pick up my toys. I guess I've always been stubborn. (laughs) I was so bruised that my mom wouldn't leave me in the nursery at church. She didn't want others to know. My dad was bigoted and goofy and was desperate to be taken seriously and kind of a mixture of Archie Bunker and Fred Flintstone. In the midst of all of this, even as young as two years old, the presence of God was palpable to me. I don't really understand why or how, I just know it was the most real thing in my life right in the middle of all the craziness. As I grew older, I was surrounded by people who loved me. The librarian at my elementary school noticed me and knew I loved to read. She didn't know that reading was my escape from reality and pulled me out of class to work in the library and would give me first dibs on new books when they came in. My teacher, who I had in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, whose name was Mrs. Smiley, became my lifelong friend and cheerleader, always telling me I was smart and can do whatever I set my mind to. The adults at church and the youth group members who were several years older than me began to include me in their activities when I was very young. We had several sets of parents who took us all camping or water skiing or just invited us into their homes. I am sure they have no idea that they saved my life. This pattern continued into college. I was the easygoing girl from DC who pledged club, ran almost every day, and just loved being with people. They didn't know that my family turmoil crept into my college life and that often my family would contact me and my mind and my soul would be struggling with all those emotions. Sorry, turning pages is hard. I struggled academically also, but not because I didn't understand things, more because because I was distracted by home. My junior year, I went home for Christmas. My younger brother had often been in trouble with the law, driving his motorcycle everywhere and with drugs, and those encounters were becoming more frequent and more violent. One night, right right after Christmas, I was lying in bed reading, and my brother and his friends were in his room right below me. I could hear my dad in the room with them, and there was so much yelling. I got out of bed and went downstairs. My dad was standing in front of my brother with a sledgehammer. I stood between them and told my brother and his friends to leave. I went upstairs and called the police, but when they arrived, they just laughed at me. 
I've never revisited this story with my brother or anyone else in my family, but my memory of what happened next was my dad smashed my brother's car with the sledgehammer he had been carrying. My friend called at just the moment I walked back into the house and asked if I wanted to go to the movies with a group of friends. He immediately knew something was wrong and said he was rushing over to pick me up. He was also in college and was home alone while his parents were visiting family for Christmas. We were not dating, but had been friends our whole lives. That night we slept together, and the next morning I left my family a note and flew back to Abilene. It was very obvious very quickly that I was pregnant. My housemates were kind and nurturing, but some of their parents were very distressed by the situation. I withdrew from school and went to live with dear friends in Fresno, California. My adorable baby boy, Corey, was born in September, and I moved back to D.C. with my parents. I know, I know. I can see it now, but couldn't then. Bad choice. So it was back to Abilene for me. I lived in a tiny duplex apartment in the alley between East North, East North 16th and college. I was working and paying for daycare and so poor that I often only had orange juice in my refrigerator. I also, was also attending Highland as I had in college. I would come to Sunday morning service and take Corey to the nursery. Any of you remember the big light board to the side that would light up when your baby was inconsolable and they needed you to return to the nursery? Um, every Sunday, John and Evelyn Willis would find me to ask how I was doing. That summer, I returned to Camp Amaba for a visit, the place that feels more like home to me than any place else. Tim Danley was working there that summer. We had dated before and known each other our whole lives, going to church together and living three blocks apart. One night while I was there, we stayed up into the wee hours of the morning talking. Camp was and still is the place I feel belonging and acceptance and where I learned that the love of God did not fit in a box and that people could follow Jesus and show that 24 hours a day. I went back to my parents' house to get ready to fly back to Abilene the next day. And our friend Jim asked him what he was thinking and if he wanted, sorry, everything's falling, um, if he wanted to make things work with me and if me being a single mom made any difference. I should give a disclaimer here. He was dating someone else at the moment. Tim said he did want to make things work and Jim asked him, then what are you doing? Get in your car and drive to see her. It was about an hour away. We sat on my front porch, well, not really a porch, kind of more of a stoop, and Tim asked if we could start over. I asked if he was sure, and he said, yes, I am sure. We were engaged by the end of August and married in December. What a sweet life we have had, and Corey, my son, from before Tim, only considers Tim his dad and feels incredibly lucky to have him. I believe this piece of poetry speaks to what I have said about my life and how each person's kind input into my life shaped me. This is called Small Kindnesses by Danusha Lamaris. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by, or how strangers still say bless you when someone sneezes, a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. And sometimes, when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it, to smile at them and for them to smile back. For the waitress to call us honey, when she hands us that bowl of clam chowder, and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire. Only these brief moments of exchange. What if, we are the true, what if they are the true dwelling of the holy, these fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, go first. I like your hat. It is the small kindnesses I remember that have changed my life. John and Evelyn and their persistence to care for me. Our friend Jim encouraging Tim to pursue a relationship. The older kids in my church including me. The librarian and the teacher who loved me and believed in me the adults at our church who gave of their time in the way that they loved us through fun. God holds us and speaks to us through the body of Christ, through the kindness of strangers and those close to us, and with presence, that palpable presence of God that sometimes doesn't make yet sense and yet is full and rich and real, even when we least expect it. This scripture from Ephesians hangs very large on my living room wall and has spoken to me since I could read about God's all-encompassing love and the family that surrounds us. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in on heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray 
that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and long and high is the love of Christ, and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Thank you, Julie. Uh, If you're able, let's stand. Let's worship.
Good morning, Highland, and welcome to the table of the Lord. My name is Shane Hughes. I'm one of the ministers here. And it's pretty clear if you spend any amount of time in the New Testament that the way that the first century Christians practiced the Lord's Supper or Eucharist, love, feast, communion was different than the way we practice it. It seems clear that there was, there was a meal involved. And th that meal involved real food, not as one person called it, the insufficient snack that we experience here on Sunday morning. But that, that real food meant that there was, there was time for conversation and time for laughter and time for sharing story, time for holding one another's grief. And it was somehow in the midst of that conversation that was Jesus-centered as the host of the table that the early church is transformed. And, and over the course of time, the Lord's Supper as we experienced it has been sacramentalized and that's that's good that's fine but and it but it has emphasized the the vertical experience of what we're about to do and maybe at times we've left out that horizontal conversation of sharing stories with one another about what God is doing in our lives about what we've seen on the faces of our brothers and sisters the look of Jesus. And it's, it's impossible to miss that the, the, the cross and the empty tomb, the resurrection story of Jesus Christ, is, is buttressed on both sides, is sandwiched by communion. It begins in the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, and it, and it ends on this road to Emmaus. And it's almost as if Luke is saying, if you want to experience the risen Savior... You're going to have to go through communion to get there. You're going to have to experience the joy that we share with one another. You're going to have to experience what it's like to hold the presence of grief with one another. So let's turn our hearts to these words in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. Now, on that same day, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And, and he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels that said that he was alive. And some of those with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but, but they did not see him. Then he, Jesus, said to them, Oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things, then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses... And all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all of Scripture. And as they came near the village which, to which they were going, he walked on ahead as if he were going on. But, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it's, it's, it's almost evening and day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, 
He took bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? The word of the Lord. I think what we, what we can pick up from this story is, is two things. At least that's where I want us to land today. The first is how the experience of Jesus rolls back the previous encounter. It interprets your past. And, and I, so I think for some of us, our past doesn't make a whole lot of sense at times. We don't understand why we endured what we had to endure. We don't know why we suffered while we had to suffer. We don't know why our lives were as simple as they were or, or as blessed as they were. Sometimes that doesn't make any sense at all. But it's at the encounter of Jesus. It's when Jesus broke the bread and blessed it because it, he, they'd seen that a hundred times before. They'd seen him do that exact same motion and said those exact same words. And when he did it, their eyes were opened. And all of a sudden, they went back to their past and said, weren't our hearts burning when he was telling us about Scripture? Where was the last time you saw Jesus? Now, that, you may take that question to mean to vision. and That, that may have happened to you. That may have not. That's, that's not really what I'm asking. When's the last time you experienced the face of Jesus in the face of a friend? in the kindness of a stranger, in the, in the discipline of to be present to your family and you, you find in that discipline the joy of what it means to be there with them through the eyes of a child, through the eyes of grace that helps you to see new things that you never saw before and you feel nearer to the kingdom than you ever did through the mercy of God, through a, a good community that loves you with a, a million little acts of kindness where was the last time you saw Jesus? The other part of this text that jumped out to me this week as I was living in it was, was the fact that the disciples had to urge Jesus to stay. He was going to go on. But it was, it was through their hospitality and their invitation, in fact, their insistence, come, come be with us, come eat with us, it's late, please stay with us. It is through creating that space of, of hospitality that they were able to encounter the risen Lord. And I wonder what that means for our church. Where's the last time you saw Jesus? And maybe you don't have the language to say, yeah, I've, I've seen Jesus. So just think in your heart and in your mind, when's the last time I felt like transcendence? Some, some feeling welling up in me that was, that was bigger than life, that was, that was outsized for the experience that I was having, that, that sense of the, where the heavens open up for just a minute, the sky just seems a little more blue. When's the last time you felt that? For me, it was, it was right, right there. It was after church about, about nine months ago. And, uh, and I'd, I'd done first and second service, and at the end of second, I was just kind of worn out. And, and so I was just looking forward to, uh, to getting out of here and going home and taking a nap. And... Uh, and, and I, was, I, was, I was here talking to people, and, and this woman came up that I'd never met before. Her name was uh, Felicia Hopkins. And some of you may remember Felicia. She was a preacher at uh, St. Paul's United Methodist here in town, and, and then she moved on. She was promoted, and now she's the bishop of, of our region for the United Methodist Church. And she was just coming around and visiting churches, and, and she came to Highland that Sunday. And, and she came up, and, and I think she was confused at first, because she said, man, you re preach really different than you used to. And I was like, I'm not sure what you're talking about. We figured out she thought I was Jonathan Stormont. I'm not, but that's okay, you know. I just preach different than I used to. Um, and she was, she was there with her adult son, and her adult son lives at, at DRI. He's a, uh, it's, a, it's a place for... Uh, people with adult disabilities that can, can kind of live with assistance. And, and her son was like, he's six foot four, and he is a very big guy, 240 pounds. And, and she said, well, can, can we pray for you? And I said, of course you can pray for me. And so she takes her, my hand, and, and her son kind of puts his arm on my shoulder, and I feel like the weight of his body on my shoulder. He just leans into it. 
And she begins to pray. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret that um, pastors kind of have a Rolodex in their heads of appropriate prayers because you don't know if it's Thanksgiving at your house or wherever. Someone's going to ask you to pray. And so, and so I have this Rolodex of a prayer blessing, and, I, and that's what I assumed was happening. Is she, she pulled out her blessing prayer from her Rolodex, and she begins to speak it. And, and I'm standing right there, and my head is bowed, and my eyes are closed, and I'm, I'm feeling the weight of her son, and I'm, I'm holding her hand as she's praying. And it's in, it's in the midst of this prayer. It's at the end of second service. My eyes are closed, and it's like the, the stage lights turn on. Now, normally, we turn on the house lights, we turn down the stage lights, and it's the end of the story. We all go our separate ways. And so I'm wondering to myself, as this woman is praying, who is messing with the lights and why? But they seemed brighter that day. I don't know if you've ever looked at the, closed your eyes and looked at the sun and you kind of have that, you kind of see the pink of the inside of your eyelids. It, it looked like that. And my, my forehead felt warm. And it was only for a moment that that happened, but it was in that moment while she was praying, and I will never forget the words that she said. She said, and when he is alone, or, and when he is enduring the darkness of the light, help him remember that he is not alone. And after she said that line, somebody turned the lights back down, and she said amen, and I thanked them, and I went on my way. This is what... Felicia couldn't have known, because really nobody did. It was about that time, about a year ago, that I was having panic attacks. I was having anxiety, and, it, and they would happen unexpectedly, and they were happening pretty frequently for me at that time. And um, most often, they would occur about the same time of day, and the panic attack, it felt like a heart attack. It wasn't, but it felt like it. It was a tightening in my chest and my pulse was racing. Sometimes even my arm would hurt. Um, but but the, the feeling that I had was I'm about to die. And that makes sense because my sister died of a heart attack about, about two and a half years ago. And, and I, in my head, I thought my sister died and so am I. It wasn't rational. It was, just, it was just what kind of got caught as a track in my head. And so every time one of these panic attacks happens, I wondered, do I need to drive to the hospital? And they'd happen about the same time every night, about 2, 2.30. Wake up in the middle of the night, my heart racing, my chest tight, wondering what's going on. How could that woman have known? But in that moment, in that gentle warming light, and the prayer that she offered as a blessing she said, remember that he is not alone. And I, I wish the end of the story was, and I never had a panic attack again. But that's not true. I wish the end of the story was I was healed, but, but they still happen. Not as frequent, but they're still there. And I still wake up at 2 a.m., 2.30 sometimes with my chest tight and my heart pounding and this feeling of dread. But now I know. Now I know that I'm not alone. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen Jesus, but I heard his voice that day. And so what we want to do during this time of communion is, is invite you to share. Just like last week, if you were here last week, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to offer two questions. And I'd like you to turn to somebody next to you. And if you don't know who they are, introduce yourself and allow them to introduce to you. And, and the key to this thing is to really listen to that person. Don't just wait for your turn to tell your story. Really listen to what they have to say and, 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 and allow that space to fill our, our minds. And if you don't want to play, that's fine. If you don't want to participate, just pull out your phone, start scrolling, and we know you're not into it, and that's okay. But what I want you to do is, is, is answer one of these two questions to somebody around you. The first question is, is, is tell a time when you recognize Jesus, the face of someone you love. Maybe it was a vision, the voice or the presence of God in a way that you cannot explain in any other way. Because maybe it was just somebody messing with the lights. Or maybe it was a loving father who was trying to send me a message. 
And some days I have the faith to see it one way, other days I don't. But I know that moment is just stuck in my life. It's become this, this flagpole, this marker that's beginning to reinterpret some of the other things that have happened to me. Or, or, or share a time when you felt transcendent joy. If you, if you can't get there to that Jesus line, tell, uh, share a time when you felt transcendent joy or you felt transcendent peace or you felt transcendent love. Share one of those stories. Take just a moment. Talk to the person next to you. We're going to gather back after that with a, with a song and we'll share communion together. Take a moment to share with one another. Take about 30 more seconds, and then uh, at that time, servers, I'm going to invite you forward. Servers, you can come forward.
saints and angels they bow before your throne all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God that and sing you are worthy of it all it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory I'll sing all the saints with me all the saints and angels they bow For the Lamb of God and sing, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing that with us. We're just going to sit there. You are worthy of it all, Jesus. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. you pray with me? Heavenly Father, if we are anything, we are the people that have been transformed by an empty tomb. And we share the trajectory of the early disciples, the trajectory of joy in the face of hardship, and this compulsion to share our story, to share the story of your son Jesus, to tell of the encounter that we had, whether a road to Emmaus or a road in Abilene. So Father, we remember, we remember the body of your son Jesus. We remember the price that was played in his blood. But we also remember that we have seen his glory and it has transformed us and is transforming us and continues to move and shape our lives. We give you praise for your son. It is in his name we pray. And the church says, amen. This is the body of Christ, which was broken for you. Highland, this is the cup that represents his blood that was shed for you. May you stand for our benediction.
this week as you go, it doesn't really matter the road that you're on or where you're headed. May you ponder the mystery and the beauty of the power of the resurrected Lord. May you see his face in the least of these and in your brothers and sisters. May you be filled with his presence and go in peace. And one last thing, our His Kids has been going really long today. So if you have littles, please head to His Kids first. Go in peace. Oh